Yes. So, good evening and welcome to the corporate owners meeting. It's now seven o'clock and I would like to start this meeting. I would like to remind everyone present that this meeting is being recorded for publication on the Council's website at a later date, as this meeting is being held within the College instead of the Council Chamber. There is limited time of use of this venue. As you know, we have to be out by 9.30. So um, I'm hoping that we will finish earlier than that, so it gives them time to get downstairs, etc. Uh, firstly, Grace, are there any apologies received? No, Chair. Thank you. I move to the minutes of the last meeting on the 16th of November, um, and uh, I need your approval that these are correct records for what happened. Councillor Howden. Uh, thank you, Chair. On page 15. I asked a question regarding the KPIs dropping from 80% down to 61% for children receiving their first initial health assessment. The committee asked whether that was because what was the breakdown between failures of the health service or the family choosing not to uh, consent to a health assessment. We were told that was going to be chased up the committee. I've not seen an answer unless anyone else has. Grace, has anyone given you an answer or emailed you over an answer? No, I haven't seen anything. I can chase it up. If you could, so we've got it by the next meeting. Or by the next meeting, or do you want to actually put it out before the next meeting? Oh, all right, yeah. yeah. I was well, actually in November of last year. Yes, that was our last meeting. Yeah. Right. And I know um, Bookie had asked for an update on if she was interested in the Thameside Theatre and the meetings, and you said you'd like feedback on that. And so I did ask Councillor Cockshell to give a feedback on that as well as the uh, GM14. Thank you. So nothing else. So I can just, uh, put it as a true copy and I'll sign it. Agreed? Agreed. Um, I haven't agreed to any um, items of urgent business this evening. Does anyone have any declarations of interest to make tonight? No. Um, Right, so I'd like to ask Councillor Cockshaw for an update, please. An update. I'm going to give you a rounded view of really more than an update. I think what we've got to do is someone has to be asking some questions about the portfolio and what we're doing. I think we've got to actually really look at, and I'm going to put it as, as a corporate body, and I'm trying to put my portfolio as a corporate entity for the committee. And there's two really questions that, that, that come out of my portfolio. Is, can we for survivors a standalone local authority? And have we capacity to do what we in future we really want to do and want to do for the borough? And and then two items really are where we where we have concerns with in the last year since we've taken on the more relations and actually taken on some external bodies. There is a couple of things outside that that I think is an opportunity for the borough. And the opportunity for the borough is the free port, which is the big one of these opportunities. And then the local association, local um, South and six local authorities. Now that was obviously been set up in 2016. Since then, it really, since the first few summers, took it just about planning. That's moved on from that into loads of our higher opportunities across that. And I think from, from previously, in the last 12 years, there was conversations about how the corporate bodies should survive. It's that first question. And then what we should be doing with that. So I was barking and back and looking towards London and looking outwards. And, in, and if you look at that and then come down from that corporate body into the other programs, you come up to the question, what are the capacity issues? If you look through, I think you've got both paper and have the program later on in the evening, and you just have to look at that and see that for, a, for a body that's the size of a small size of a district, smaller than some districts that have small to us even, that, that is a huge capital program and a huge amount of work that we need to be doing. And just look at some of them. I know some of them about the A13 finally coming to the end and the education planning that we've done over the last uh, for new properties, new buildings and also school places, maybe in the last 12 years is just slowly slowing down after such a hiatus you know, since 2010 of building new education facilities. But there's still some priorities to do in there that I see in my view. It's the A13 slip roads, which is I think in the priority between 30 and 50 years in my view. The Gravestown Centre, and the great and the underpass are, are my priorities. The Stanford Interchange, and then the most important one, which I think I was talking just a minute ago, was 
which was the IMCs, the Interface Militancies are critical to this. And then obviously ongoing, you can see the other ones in there are just include simply include these expressions. But I must say, the most important one that's not in my portfolio, which I do have as I know, is obviously the HRA Pro House Homes, uh, transforming where we're living with the council properties, or making sure we build more council properties, which I think is a priority of question 49. And then I think two questions that I would like to be to the is, um, is the high house production park, is it for, or is it for uses on that, and then per foot regeneration limited. It's been a long time coming, and that's a frustration, I think, across the board where we are with that. Part. And then you've got to remember, then we go around, and there's the new towns boards, which are not part of the council, but they do push on to the pressure on, more pressure on to these projects, and then projects that are by place, and that still puts more pressure on the actual quality of our the offices that I've been working with. And then, we, and then we go on to my other new items, I don't know if you want to touch on that, is the relation to the inter-seller of how we do the TED district growth board. And, and they are the reason why for the last year or so that um, Luke was asking me to look at them as well, because they're intuitively linked to our, our, our programs, and most of our funding comes from quite a few out of them, and how how we work from there is really important. So I actually did to that, did it that way, our future, what we can do with our future, and what we see thoroughly to that. And I don't see inside that that we always talk about 2050, it's a nice number. But I think because of the free ports now, we should be really looking at 2030. And how 2030 is, is, is reasonably within people's mind, so we could still be here in 2030, and some of us in 2050, and I don't think we can sit here, and so it's a long way away. And like as councillors, so, so <laughs> even the younger ones are sitting there, it, 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 it seems a long way away, and the, the vision is 2030, and I understand. 2050 vision is always on everyone's minds and the 2050 vision is, comes about because of um, environment agencies and where we're trying to actually make sure London's right but we should be fixated on that. In conclusion I think uh, because, because the future in the program can look in, in the future where we'll see in the next year or so where we are we're still looking backwards we've got to a problem to big issues around the leveling up which is due in the end of this month and what leveling up means for thorough. But that does give more pressure again on the capacity issues. How do we do letting in our bids? <coughs> what and the local plan is, is the biggest thing in my portfolio, where I think the local plan coming through to get a draft local plan the back end of this year and try and get to actually submission in 2013. I think that's an important thing. And I'm proud that we've gone through over the last few years from 2000 to 2011 strategy uh, to actually focusing on the for our plans. Continuously, there's a majority of people have got lots of consultations, and I think we're moving in the right direction. And I'm hoping that continues as we come to draft local plan here. So we don't look at it as a party issue, we look at it as whether it's what's best and how we can deliver, whether that's 2040, 2030, or wherever you want the medium to long term plans. And, I, and, I, and I, outside that, I think there's one thing we need to do is what comes back to where I started with can we survive as a local authority? And what we should be doing as a local party. And this. And I think it was a good thing that happened in 98. And I think really this, I would think that we need to make sure we punch above our weights across our area near the Lowestone and make sure we stay as an entity in this in these fractious times you see the financial interest issues around that and how that is it sustainable. You know, Councillor Kent had these issues when he was in, in, in charge of the authority, and that's still an ongoing issue. I think it's coming to a head with our aging population. And we need to really look at that. And I've started thinking in my head, if we can't find partners, and we don't find partners, right, what should we look like? And I keep saying, so I've said this a couple of times, should we be the City of London of Essex? And how do we make sure that happens? And is Freeport the answer to that? That's a question that is still in my mind as we go on. Leave that to you if you want some questions about that. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, I've got just one question for you, uh, I go to Councillor Howden. And that was, when do you envisage um, the local plan will actually be delivered? You know, we talked about the back end, the front end, and I know that's probably a bit difficult, but it has been up most to It's been, uh, the, the local plan is frustrating to a lot, like, I think, everyone here, because if you look around, if the government thinks we should be having a local plan for a and we don't put uh, the thousand numbers on us, let's, the, low, the lower tension crossing has been a misery to our local plan. In fact, it's been a delay to our local plan and removes housing numbers, not adds to them. And, uh, and, and now we've been 
the legislators to go in parallel and ignore that for a lot of whatever happens to that approach policy. We, I think, are hopefully have drawn up a plan, as I say, back in this year that we can all be looking at. I hope in post summer we can all work as working groups and then um, um, some working parties to bring back the lower, lower working groups, so lower, 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 lower working groups of the leader and, and, and the conversations and how we do with all parties to make sure that it's not just one party local plan. You see that in other problems, and that's why the delay is important. If you look at other parties next door to us, it becomes once one party goes one way and another, the local plan changes, and that can't happen. I, don't, I think that's what we, one thing we said in point of Burrock is that we try and keep that so we all, uh, so the officers, when they speak to someone, one councillor to another councillor, we're on their round with, with the, we know where we're going and a direction, and that is an important part. Post May, post into the, the last six months of this year, I think after the year of the local plan last year, with the slight delays, I know we've run over to recently, into into February, so the community groups, but we will get that done, and they're back in the year. So they've been voting on the Reg 18 back in this year, essential. The final submission next year, 2024, hopefully. I think, yeah, and as you say, stability is all important, and we, uh, we all involve. Yeah. Councillor Howden. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Councillor Foxhall. Uh, for joining us. What, one of the issues that I'm very concerned about is long term what we actually do as an authority. Um, I think my figure is still right that when I was the cabinet member for social care, um, Essex had something in the region of 10 times the amount of self funders in care than we do. You know, demographically, we're in a tough, tough spot, and that's just not getting any easier. So, long term, we need to look at the, the size and the shape of the council. Um, and our, our capacity to deliver. I asked a question at the last committee meeting about you know, how are we going to resource that natural blue sky thinking and make sure that Thurrock is sufficiently armed when government do inevitably do another round of consultation on local government form. So can I just ask you, where is your mind in terms of, um, you mentioned a body like Asla, is this the solution that we should be looking at? I that, that, that's a question that's evolving at the moment. That's the question I posed myself last year, and the leader asked me last year to well, what, what we, should, we should do. And, and that's a question that I think we need we, isn't an answer at the moment to come answer. Is, as, if there is an issue that you've raised quite rightly, I think we've all raised that, and there's been an issue of uh, that, 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 that ticking time bomb uh, sitting here in Thurrock. And can we survive? Is that really a relevant question? You see the financials later on this evening. Is that what the RASA, I think, was? I don't know, is the question. I don't know if that ca is, it has got the capability of that with local government reform. And is it right for, for the borough of Thurrock Firm as well, as we were talking about? Does do, how do we plough our own borough, or do we have to find partners? And finding partners is the right thing we can quite ready to go, but should it be it should be on the terms that are right for the borough? And that's what I'm going at. I mean, we should be going to push forward into this. And that's the question, really, maybe you need to, I don't know, we talk about programs, but it is a question that I need, we need, we all need help on that, and where do we go, and what does the future look like? And that's where that, and it, I don't think we should just stick our hat on the South Essex Association with the local authorities. I think we do think that that's an evolving question, is that the right answer? So check, why did you follow up, please? And that, that's going to require really complicated financial modelling, that's going to require you know, weighty submissions to government because it's quite possible that other entities can put in submissions with regards to reform that may not tell you what we want. So have we got the capacity internally to lead that? Is there anything that you feel as a cabinet member that you require that you haven't got? Is it something this committee needs to be looking at? Where, where do you think you stand in terms of do we think the council, do we think we are currently sufficiently armed to do that work? I, another number of things, I don't know that question. I think there's getting this that capacity issue. You look at capacity into our into our projects in my department and the capacity growing in the department is growing in compared to the other part in the parts elsewhere, other than other separate departments. Yeah, it is always a pressure. But we there is a problem there, and I I know it's I'm here today, so I was glad to come here today because I think this what the library scrutiny would need to and, and to have a look to see where the capacity is and where our options are. And if we get the housing white paper, the housing white paper, that quite with the, whether that paper comes out with the evolution, I 
think we do need that capacity to make sure we're putting our money and the body into government to make sure that we get what's best for the borough of Thurrock. Like, I don't want to see us go back to where we were pre 1998. Um, but we've got to make sure we're sustainable for that, otherwise, we may take that off our hands. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm very mindful of time as well, but uh, is it okay? Yeah, just quickly, is it possible to get a copy of updates from you? I mean, on the same side? And also, on, and, and also on the city purposes, because I am genuinely asking this. Question yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 I know right. nothing was happening. Why I know. I, I, so, I, I, I can give an update at the same time. I think it, the community groups are fantastic. I said last week that we're working, I spoke to the community groups. At the end of this month, we'll be still working with community groups and see if we can actually get, they can produce a small company that can take over the whole running of the building and long short to medium term but as i said last week the worst thing possible is to remove hand them an asset that's unviable that they can't make work because that'd be even worse for us as a council whoever's in charge to actually see them start putting shutters up like they did in basil when they tried this before and i don't want to see five six years with a closed theater that'd be worse than something that given it away they think he's gone from the borough and this, the, wherever the officers see that's not off their books and then it doesn't work so i think they meet at the end of the month and be good with the community groups to see if they can come and get the changes both ways and see if we can find some funding for that and see if we can actually make sure that they've got to survive and to make sure back in March in Cabinet, March Cabinet, I think an undertaking, we'll have an answer to what happens with the same side past that, past March. Mm-hmm. And, and obviously, the, last, the other question was, yeah, the civic offices. I'm really disappointed, I was really hoping, I'm sorry, today we're going to be in the civic offices at the end of the month. Um, it looks like we can't be in the simple office in the month because due to COVID and care and the furniture. Um, but we will be moving forward in moving to moving to civic offices into February. But I think COVID over Christmas and care's delivery and the furniture to be delivered is the problem with delays in that. You may be able to answer. Yeah, Chair, if, if I can. I mean, I, I visited that the week, um, the first week of January, and everything was looking really positive at that stage. Uh, and then within a week, um, there were delays to the supply chain of the uh, council furniture arriving, um, that they needed to be fitted before we then put in all of the audiovisual stuff. So there was delays in supply chain there, which is quite common in more recent months. And there has been the impact of nine people on the team going down with COVID or having to isolate because of COVID um, symptoms and so on within the team as well. And that just pushed it back. But uh, the, week, the week before, we were sort of 97, 98% in there for council meeting on um, on January, but that, that then got ripped apart in the following week. And to just a quick comment, it would be nice for information, you know, for us to know where we are, mm-hmm. because being kept in the dark is like we're not n- nobody, we're like an entity when it comes to uh, well, um, I, I think you've identified something else in the good point that's not in my list because I'm trying to not to avoid, I'm not the leader, I'm trying not to drop into other people's but it, it does go back to communications of the thing, and, and I only learned that out the weekend because I actually went to find out and found it myself this morning or yesterday. And, and it's, discerning, it's disappointing, but I think it was out of our hands with the nine people not to touch it. Yeah, can I just check that though, Bucky? One last thing after our last meeting, um, we had the residents come and spoke, spoke to us all, and we actually let them have quite a lot of time and they specifically asked, would Councillor Copsham and Councillor? Do them live with them from the Thames side, and lo and behold, from that meeting, that's exactly what we did, and as well, come to us an update. So, mm-hmm. I do think when you ask, we do here act. No, no, thank sure you for the update. I'm not saying that yeah, no, the yeah. people are all should be respected. I, I, I just, I just, I, I, I quite yeah. agree with you. I think yeah. just because me going out and finding out, and it <coughs> should be more regularly, so there must be proactive, that should be because there was a delay. We were all expecting to be in there at the end of the month, expecting to actually everything I know, John's taking and never expect. I do. It went round at the beginning of the Christmas and it looked really it all hopeful, here or hopeful. But, Okay. You're, you're, you're missing the point. Councillor Kent. You're, you're, you're missing the point, if I may say. We had an email this evening that said the next council meeting won't be in the new offices. Yes. That's the first communication that members have had at all. Yes. I wasn't expecting to be in there because nobody's told me we might be. I didn't know if it's going to be next Christmas. 
or, or, or time. Yeah, that, there's been nothing coming out to members at all. And that's why I just said to you, I think that is a point. I don't want to do <coughs> community communications, no, no. internal comms to local comms. I think that if you wanted to talk about corporately, about what is our identity to the borough, it starts from the top and then it comes down. And I do think this, and I'm not denying that there's an issue of comms, whether it's internal to keep people updated or members or external relations, are they? And it's that's a small example, but that goes wider than what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yeah. I, I only phrase it because yeah. book has raised it. On, yeah. on the Thames side, I'm pleased that progress is being made. You know that I came to Cabinet last July, yeah. and it was one of the things that I asked that we look at was, was sort of trying to help yeah. foster some sort of community entity to take it over. I think you're absolutely right, though. It can't be a hospital pass. It's got to be a, 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 a kind of set of conditions that give them a fighting chance of still being there in 10, 15 years, yeah. not something that kind of lasts for a year and yeah. then collapses. It's got to be sustainable. Yeah, and that, that, that's the mind. risk so, I mentioned in cabinet last yeah. week about that. I've just answered that, John. Because like, if we, it's easy to come off the books and then it's gone yeah. forever, and then that's, it's risk, high risk. It's, it's high risk on both sides. Yeah, so, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then I don't, I'd rather, I'd warn you now, I'd rather not do that and then, and then just take to, if you stick to it, stick to say like no, we can't give you at this moment, we'll have to close because that'd be worse to have a false hope. Absolutely. And and I don't want that. And I, I'm hoping by January we come at the end of January we can move forward another meeting with the community groups to see if they limited company works right, to see if the, the two people can work, see how we can work through that and see what happens there. Yeah. Sure. Um, yes, sure. Yeah, to, to, to all three things there's that that's a whole variety of things. Um yeah, just, just to let you know, the next meeting of, of the round table to, to progress that is on Tuesday next week. So that will be the third meeting since the last corporate overview and scrutiny committee. So, um, and there's been other sort of less less meetings, if you like, before that. There's an officer meeting, meeting first thing tomorrow, actually in preparation of that, because there's quite a lot we need to do to be able to support the community and building the business case, etc. as well. And, and Mark's just mentioned, for instance, to you and those sorts of things. So we're, we're working on that, um, as I say, and that's quite quite close. In terms of the comms bit, I get that. Um, so I'll take that back. I've got the director's board tomorrow, and I'll, I'll feed that back then. I mean, I actually knew we weren't going to be in the chamber Thursday afternoon last week. So that's that. it was quite recent still, you know, from, from that point. Um, but as I say, week before that, it was uh, it was very much a go. But I, I recognise the communication bit, and I'll take that one more point now. Yeah. Well, it's, it's John's point is, 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 a, is a valid point. If, 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 if you know, members other than me, actually knowing because it was just, just you in that bubble and you knew that we were aiming for that. But if you're not even told that we were intending to be there, I think there is something more. I'm, 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 certainly there is a problem, and I, I think I, I, I've identified an issue, and I don't know how to do that and how the internal communications to the council on that. Right. Well, um, going on from that then, so. Sean, sure, we'll take that back to uh, director's board. Also regarding the Thames side, when they've all had their meetings, etc. Now I'll go back to John in a minute. Um, can we have another update at the next corporate um, corporate overview scrutiny for the people that do, or do you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think you know we've got a valid point. Okay, John. I just want to go back to the the, the, the real meeting thing that, yeah. that Mark was talking about, which, yeah. which is where we fit in with the kind of sub-regional yeah. architecture, how we lever in capacity from, from other places from those around us. Yeah. You, you know, you, you put it almost as, as kind of the, 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 the twin um, kind of issues of, of both surviving and thriving. Yeah. So making sure we have the capacity to deliver the day job. Yeah. Whilst bringing in uh, all of the kind of expertise and extra capacity we need uh, to deliver on, on what is still a, a, a very ambitious regeneration agenda, and one that uh, across party we 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 really kind of share for you know, you know at, at least at least 12, 12 years. Yeah. And one of the blockages that I always found was Essex County Council, so we could make substantial progress on working together. Uh, across South Essex and then uh, at one point bring in Brentwood in. Uh, and you know, the, the dead hand of the county council was 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 always there. So, so I guess the first question is, is that still an issue? And, and the second part for me does kind of really hinge on what happens in, in that we have enough white paper. Uh, you know, 
it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. We know these things have been actually difficult, and we know that there's no point in having a, a, a white paper like that unless it actually gives some solutions and gives some opportunities. I, I think in the old way of, of, of thinking, what we've been looking at, I think, is still a combined authority across South Essex, which you know, under the current rules, we have an elected mayor and would look at kind of transport and major infrastructure and skills and all those kind of things, whilst leaving uh, local authorities to, to sit alone and carry on with the political kind of day job. And I just, just, just wonder if, if there might be something more ambitious in there. And then you get the thing about what we used to call kind of dumb devolution. So combined authority allows government to recognise the extra capacity that's been brought in. So to give funding because they have some more confidence and trust that an entity of that size can deliver. But in return, that entity and local authorities have to give more uh, to, to, to the citizens of, of, of the place. And I wonder what, what your feel is for where we are with that levelling up white paper, given that actually we might have a change of prime minister by then, so the whole thing gets uh, shelved, shelved again, which, yeah. which in many ways would, would, would be a disaster. Yeah. And, and finally, this time last year, about this time last year, uh, it, the, the League signed a memorandum of understanding with Basildon uh, to do some work about yeah. where Farrakh and Basildon might position themselves. What's happened to that work? Where are we then? Right. Um, right. The, I'm doing, I'll try to say three of them. It, the, the Essex one, it's an interesting, the, the, lead, the new leader of Essex is, a, is much more open and a much less aggressive than that. And I think we need to, in tune, reciprocate with the less aggressive messages that we've seen, I think we've all done over the last few years. And we need to make sure that we, that, Basel, that, that county, the, the leader of Ketno County needs to is looking differently and treating, treating us differently, treating the whole of South Essex differently, not just for the horror of Farrah, then we need to take that you opportunity. You always understand these things a bit more. Yeah, and I think that's an opportunity there. I've reached out to the leader and to see what, where they are and what we can do and, and, and see how there's a so That's why I'm this evolving and the questions were about South Essex and local authorities. What does that mean to us? I agree with you. The white paper is due soon. We keep hearing it soon. It could be here at the end of the month. Um, it will, it's a level in that white paper, but it is really the devolution item in the white paper. It's just about, you know, that's the thing, the thing. Whether that's still on, as in it's up to us to decide, or whether it's it's the, the new Secretary of State makes it that it will, more that this is what it should look like, is where we'd like to see. I think that's a, we need something to make it survivable in, into post-2030, but it's got to be the right solution. Yeah. And I, and at the moment, I can't give you an answer to say what the solution is. My, my per, we've tried, you saw last year, and that leads on to the, the memorandum of understanding, that how we can survive, whether it's with the, looking into, the, into London, um, or the Thames Estuary Growth Board Commission suggested we should look over the river and try and be that centre just outside the city and move through a dark over the river, which was difficult and never really moved anywhere. The solution that we pushed as an administration, which is South Essex, is trying to get a combined local plan across the South Essex, the JSP, the JSC, and then that went, and then how we can work community with that. So when that moved yeah. away, we looked at the the Basildon Council to look at see if they would work with us. So we try and try, and now the change of administration in Basildon meant that that has moved nowhere. But sorry, without dragging us on one of the big that was always one of the issues, wasn't it? When, yeah. when, when you bring in together six or seven local authorities yeah. in a loose framework, yeah. two changes of administration yeah. just send you back 10 years. That's yeah. why you need a proper entity, isn't it? That's why you need yes. a combined authority. And that's why a government, a government doesn't agree because of, because of the fickles of political changes. And, we know that. and as we go back to the local plan here, where I'm flat slightly, you can see if we can work as a 49 and not as a, 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 a whole, I think that gives government more certainty that, the, 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 that we are moving in the right direction. And I think with anything about that, that's why I mentioned about how Farrakh is right for Farrakh. It's got to be not just pushed through as a political agreement of any party. It's got to be this commitment across 49 and full council to actually commit to this. But once that evolves, and I'm, if you want an open and honest answer, I think a combined authority 
for South Essex is the way to go, where we've got more synergy into Basildon and South End, and South End is now coming forward as a city, than we have anything we've got in North Essex, or definitely in the south of the river, uh, because I think that will never work. If you've got physical links. And if you look into London, there is a good part. If you really, there's that dividing line. If you go past the M25, that people think, wow, well, they're using London transport. But whether they'll be open to actually have a regional conversation into central London, I don't think will be. So our, our opportunity is South Essex, but it's got to be on our terms that are right. Because if you look at our local plan coming forward, when every one of them local plans around us is short, you, I think. I don't want to see houses built here to help to make them without some way to ensure that we've got survivability in our adult social care and our financial too. And, and, and I agree with that. The, the, the one thing I would say is, is that the two aren't actually mutually exclusive. Yeah. But if you've got that capacity and you've got that, that welter of people in South Essex, it means that you can actually buy into transport for London and you can drag it out. You can have that kind of well, contract. Very much like the C2C of China. Absolutely. Gentlemen, I'm enjoying this conversation. Obviously, I'm very aware of the time as well. Um, I've got called for it at a level. Uh, Can I just ask one more thing? So, so, I mean, I mean these, these, these issues are really, really important. Yeah. I think most members, they're not understood, they're not known. Yeah. Again, we do need better communication. We, yeah. need, we need people to be aware of, of, of what's going on. Uh, in, in my time in this committee, there's been nothing that's come forward at all. There's yeah. a committee on, on working with neighbours, suffering yeah. work. Uh, so I, any of that architecture of, of with a few months. I, I, I had I do want to ask the committee and this reason, but when I went through your your work your your, your working work uh, forward plan, there was nothing in it. There was very very small, like that, not being asked. And I think and my suggestion of this in my future is maybe we do need that. It would help if there is some point in the forward plan post May into the next years. That it would be, and I think that is an idea. I had already thought about Mark because I was very aware that it was very live, but at the time I, we hadn't said it. Obviously. No, 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 I agree that this um, year, but and next year. I think and um, I'm so the next come. year, I am actually thinking that I may call an extra call if that's allowable, just to go over those type of points need because it is so important and it does need time rather than 20 minutes. As I said, it's, it's an evolving problem, and I left it as a higher level tonight because I think it's a really important item that post the white paper, I think it does need, and I don't think me as a cabinet, or me on my own, or the leader, can actually answer that question because John's just raised the exact question that I'm always worried about is it's fickle, and what happened last year, last year to the Basildon can happen, and we don't want that here. It can be fickle, but we do need to discuss yeah. it at greater length and um, to be able to let other members know because as you brought up by Poppy, they are in the dark and uh, you know it matters to them as well. Thank you. Um, have you another question, John? No. You put your hand no. up. Uh, there's just one more question for me um, because uh, of residents, etc. A13, can you tell us when you think that may be completed as your major project? The, the A13 is on nearly the end. Uh, it's been nearly the end, or, <laughs> so we would like uh, to know. I, it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope, I hope there's other issues around it, around the, uh, the flooding, and obviously post, like some things can't be done post the uh, winter, and the, the tanks and the drainage uh, has to be done at the, uh, in the summer. But I think hopefully we should see the Q Q1 most of the, all the lanes open and I'm hoping before the end of the a Q1 in the Q2 so we see it the road open but there will be still work being done but I hope that we won't be seeing year 12 like this is County Council of Sanford Farm we will see an end to it so yeah. that, that but, but there is issues there is those issues there's issues around the pot that it's got to be finished it's got the, the handover is, is another item we can actually talk about having handovers and trunk in the road um, but that's, you know, that's, that's another bit piece of work that we've not been discussing that. We want to move on to trying to and how that, but it will. So, we, as all the intended purposes of the public, let's say Q, Q1, Q2. Q1 and Q2 for the... All the intended purposes, but that would be what you Sorry, would call... Exactly. That would be what you would call complete, as in, as we would see that we've not well, actually done any work on it. But it would be sort of general public. Yeah. this as a, a recorded meeting would say, what the hell's Q1? So we've got to begin to speak. So 
didn't understand what to say. Or quarter. Okay. And then, oh, but now we're because we're into January, so that could be the second within the second quarter. So, so I said Q1, second, Q2, Q2, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Between that time, it was just that's hopes and no bonus. Yeah, that is just because this is yeah. going to be a fair record for yeah, people yeah. to understand. Okay, lovely. Um, if you want to stay, you can do, particularly for the last bit, or if you want to go, you can go. I will stay, stay for a bit. Okay. Right, so thank you for coming to the portfolio holder. Right, um, discussion paper, Investments Committee, page 19 to 26. We've allowed 20 minutes for this. And uh, can I ask uh, Sean Clark to present the report? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing it because hopefully it's uh, self-explanatory. Uh, members will remember um, that there has been uh, discussions at this committee before and at the council meeting in July 2020 about the formation of uh, an investment committee. Uh, the main change since then, I think, is the fact that the council is no longer carrying out the investments going forward. Um, and that uh, is something that we're asking the committee to, to look at um, when they're considering the format for going forward. Um, because at the moment, it would be more a case of monitoring what we're doing, which is therefore a form of budget monitoring, capital monitoring, um, rather than getting together to determine uh, new investments in, into an entity or into a programme. So uh, this sets out four, four options for going forward, um, and we're just asking for the committee, as I say, to discuss and uh, give your views on this one for us at the moment. Option one, continue um, as we are. I don't think uh, I don't think that's going to be acceptable to anybody, and uh, I understand that. Option two is to uh, proceed with an informal arrangement. Um, option three is that there are committees who already, within their terms of reference, could cover aspects of uh, investments, monitoring, and, and management, and so on. Uh, they would be the standards of audit committee, this committee. Um, and also the General Services Committee. So there is an option just to extend the terms of reference to so make it clearer uh, that it includes um, investment activity and then to receive uh, relevant uh, uh, information to those particular committees. Or option four is uh, what the original approach had, had been doing to be, which was to establish an investment committee in its own right. Um, so they're laid out in the, in the paper. Uh, we then talk about size and composition of the committee, the skills based for training and skills that would need to be uh, required, and the fact that specialists, specialism and expertise would also uh, be required to be able to feed in and inform members and advise members accordingly as well. Um, confidentiality is, uh, is another aspect. Uh, these are com uh, commercially sensitive at any stage of, um, of the investment process. So um, I'll stop there, Chair. It's um, some options down there for people to consider this committee to be able to feed through into the full process. Any questions? Councillor Thanks, Sean, for the paper. I'm relatively relaxed in between options three and four. Um, obviously, it is a scrutiny function, it's not an executive function. So if we rolled it into here at Audit. Or had the standalone investment committee. I'm relatively relaxed about both those options. For me, I think it's about the process. I think you've got the initial phase where obviously members, you've got powers as a section 151 officer that members you know, can't physically hamstring you on. But there are certain things we need to know before investments are taken out. So we, we know that, so confirmation from you that due diligence has been done, confirmation that it's been done in a general area that we don't find um, be controversial, I not investment in the arms industry, um, but the investment is consistent with the things that members have outlined that they uh, want to see, i.e. cash in nature, we're not taking on management liabilities, we're not buying assets, like our quarry is not concerned with that mess. So I think that's the, the first stage of the process I'd like to see. That before activity happens, we're just simply told, yes, the due diligence has been done, yes, it is in an ethical industry, and now we're not taking on assets or management liabilities. And then the second part of the process would be you know, after you have gone through what you need to go through to secure it, 
then we can have a conversation um, after the fact. I think that's how we get the balance between scrutiny whilst not putting ourselves in a position where we are essentially open to commerciality being breached, which could scuff the deal before it's actually taken place. So I kind of see, that, yeah, the community is important, but it's the process which is important as well. I absolutely understand that, Chair. I think uh, my, my immediate comments will be back that we, we sort of passed that area now. The investments that we'd be doing going forward are going back to the absolute um, age old and traditional ones of lending 10 and 20 million pounds out for a few days here and now um, to other local authorities when we've got surplus cash. Um, and that was the more traditional route. So going into things like solar and CCLA, as we have done, that's, that's no longer an option. Under current government guidelines and the approach, et cetera, it's no longer an option for us. That said, and then again, I suppose it comes into part of the discussion around here, other investments that the council could look at are maybe more of a traditional local authority approach. So for instance, Thorough Regeneration Limited, in terms of our own housing company, that is investing into that, into that um, body. So that again is an investment which links into council's borrowing and so on as well. And it may be something that can be brought in. Again, you can do investments for regeneration. Um, I'm not. I'm not saying we're going to. Because if we, yeah, yeah. One of my book, two of my books, I don't see any money. But one in particular. But but you know, there, there is, for instance, they haven't asked us by the way. So please don't get into this. I'm using it purely as an example. You've got PCRL. Um, we're already putting land, and we're putting some cash into that into that project. But could there be more investment, for instance, in the whole Kirkwood um, development? Could there be more in the Grays Town Centre? Could there, you know, and so on. So there are other more regeneration-based um, uh, areas of activity which could be considered investments. I think I'm trying to differentiate between the investments that have been highly publicised in over the last two years, as opposed to maybe going back to what were and have been for decades more traditional local authority investment approaches. Um. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting actually. Just reflecting on what Sean said, I mean, my, my view is that it's not the time to establish a new committee. That, that moment has passed. Uh, I think we should kind of take a watching break. We may need to do that sometime in the future, but I think now is, isn't the time. So, so for me, uh, it, it is option three. And you, you, you've slightly changed my mind, Sean, because uh, I don't think standards and audit is particularly appropriate because I think they do have to have a dispassionate arm's length uh, kind, kind of look. I'm not particularly happy with it coming to uh, the, the corporate scrutiny committee because, as, as you've said, uh, some, some, of the, some of the stuff that, that comes forward would be sensitive, and I don't think we should be routinely turning people away, and we should do as much open as we can, which does leave you the general services committee, uh, which by the very nature of it, a, a small committee uh, which routinely has to go into exempt session because of the, the nature of it, and that's understood, uh, it is where I was leaving. But, but as soon as you start saying, but the one place you could still invest is TRL, uh, with general services committee sitting as the shareholder for TRL, it kind of creates a conflict, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. just, just just like Sean's view on that. Yeah, I, I understand that actually, and that's a really good point. I haven't really thought about the, the conflict there because li literally the TRL aspect has, has come out of discussions really in the last couple of weeks um, as, as we've been looking through things and hadn't originally been thought of um, uh, the full process. It isn't necessarily that it should go in. As I say, we've added that through. It's also like um, we wouldn't normally need an investment committee, and we never have done the TRL, but to consider. Um, you know, the regeneration activity in Greystown Centre or Kirkwood. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be part of that. It's something that could that could be considered, but it absolutely doesn't have to be part of that. So in terms of the, the point you've made, is that General Services Committee would work perfectly well and we keep TRL out of it. It would obviously be part of overall borrowing, yeah. but not for a decision around TRL. Um, Councillor Hamilton. Thank you, Chair. Uh, to be honest, I'm happy to take Councillor Kent's lead on this issue because you know, we, we've got to demand what um, the opposition really want to actually get at here. You know, the last Labour administration was the first administration ever to use taxpayer cash to invest in the solar market. And there was no investment committee then that we were offered. Um, 
the current Labour opposition voted three times for our investment strategy up to two billion pounds. So, you know, and, and now they complain about it. So I'm, I'm happy to take opposition steer on this because one way or another, we've got to get to the heart of just the just ending the the, the type of hyperbole and and um, just dishonesty that we're getting over this debate for, for a process that members have signed up to. So, you know, John wants it to roll into the General Services Committee. I'm happy to back that. Any other comments? I'll try to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, considering um, the top options, I also think about the option three as the best options. And how we think that um, what the inadequacies of the um, current way that we do things, we have to think about that. And particularly, there is a point which I think it is important in that um, the needs for competencies, I mean, uh, members rather, uh, to be able to scrutinize investment and um, you know, activities. But I do not know obviously the strength of the uh, members. I'm not knocking anybody's um, you know, competence about finance. Myself, I'm not expecting that or investment. But I think we have to look at that because the current um, general services is just by um, proportionality or by leader, deputy leader, or, you know, so, so what you're saying is the I, skill set, you're I'm not 100% sure we have the skills set. I'm not on that. I think the, the skills should be, um, you know, checked, you know, in terms of yeah. audits, the skills. And then there's nothing wrong in bringing, you know, think about the funding, obviously, all members to speak in terms of, like, them having competencies within mm -hmm. in, in that area because we are all responsible if anything sort of goes right. right or wrong. So I think to build the capacity of members, the members in the General Services Committee to do the monitoring, but the capacity, we have to be sure that um, um, the members have, have the capability to scrutinize um, investment or money. So that would mean a change of who is on the committee, possibly. I'm, just, I'm putting yeah, my, yeah. The, the way I think, I'm putting that out. Oh, yeah. And that's I, my, I totally that's my opinion. I totally agree with you. And also, my biggest fear is as well with investments, mm -hmm. they are you know, confidential. Unfortunately, sometimes before I've even got back to the council chamber, there's somebody out on the press or goodness knows what. And confidentiality is not, you know, is not a good mix, you know, with all members. And I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but it is true. That's what happened. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of where um, members from the opposite side are currently sat. Generally trying to understand what it is you would like. Because the, this, the general approach of investments, your last administration did. The approach that we have taken, the, the one billion, the two billion, you voted for three times. Now, we got to July of 2020, you called an extraordinary meeting, and then you asked for an investments committee a paper in our table. You're now talking about the General Services Committee having to have some type of financial capability training. You know, I don't believe we've got the ability to mandate that. It's not like planning where statutorily they have to go through training. So I'm, I'm, I'm generally trying to understand what it is you actually are because you vote for something, then you attack it, you do something, then you claim that it wasn't a good idea. But what is it you actually want? Because yeah, I, I think we're all trying to deliver it for you. Yeah. Can, can, can I just say something? Um, James, with you speaking, I see this is about politics. To me, it is not about politics. I have not even spoken with John about my opinion. I'm just, you know, an individual councillor. I belong to the Labour Party, but I'm saying this. And to say that the decision was made by somebody or what? somebody. Yeah, I am saying that this is, I read this paper. This is the paper that's presented to me, and I'm making my own um, opinion, judicious okay. opinion to say this is the, the way I feel about it. So, and I'm entitled to say what I feel and how I feel like it is strengthened. So it's not about, oh, you say this, or yes, yeah, you know, so what do you mean? I think what Councillor Howden is saying, Walking to you, is 
what, how do you see, what would you like of these four options put before us tonight? What would you, what would be your preference? Yeah, the reason that um, option um, four is no longer um, sort of viable is that there is no in new investment, if I believe that is right, there's no new investment going forward. It is just monitoring the, what we've got. So that is why, what is the point of setting up a new um, investment committee when you're not planning to have a new investment? Whereas we could um, stick to what we've got and look at the whatever gap that is in there and uh, resolve that gap to be uh, a better, point of time, you know, yes. to, to, be, to, to monitor that. what we've got. That is my opinion, that's my kind of opinion, that yes. is my so, opinion. Okay, that's fine. So, as one, two, and three, what would your preference? Three, I said. Oh, three. Yeah, okay. three. Right, as we are lucky enough to have only a point of confinement, Councillor Head here, I'm going to ask him, he wants to speak as well? Yeah, no, it was really just to talk about the trial. I haven't intended to speak. I haven't intended to speak principally because it is a piece of paper, frankly, for the committee. And you know, as members articulated a number of months ago, I'm sure you have your back on. I wanted to talk about the governance arrangements, and this is what this paper is about. And I, I wanted to come back to the point that, that Councillor Bernardo was talking about, which was around the training. And the reason why that, that rhymes a bit with me is because I've sat on the Essex Pension Fund. And part of that um, was around developing pensions knowledge and capability with the pensions regulator. And I think they gave a level of sort of competence, um, a level of understanding for lay members who traditionally perhaps wouldn't have had a role on any sort of pension advisory panel or anything like that. So that's kind of where number four come in um, with that. Now, I don't know whether there's a, a hybrid option. Is there an option 3A? Is there an option 3B, 4A, whatever. The point being is if you want something that works and you know, Okay, perhaps it's only you and me that's going to worry about it. I don't know. But the point being is, it's just something to think about. If members don't think it's relevant, then I'll oh, shoot it down. But we just wanted to have a real brainstorm and just put out there some ideas. And this is what the discussion is about. Yeah, what's your thoughts? Do you want to come to home? Well, I mean, he's sort of putting a nutshell on what he wants to say. I think we are. Yeah, so there's no point in saying anything. Yeah. So. Um, what worries me about this is that on this um, on this report is uh, I think Sean wants to say something. So I was, I was going to come in off, off the back of some of that. Uh, again, the training and so on would come in more so if you were carrying out new investments, which, which we're not. I think um, what Councillor Head has just talked about in terms of awareness of some of the information that's coming through rather than the training qualification. I make that distinction. That that's something that, that can easily be done through um, through uh, the, the consultants that the council uses, or or any new consultant should should the committee see fit that way. Um, and what we would also look at is that the reports that would go there would be not just coming from us, but would be coming from external consultants that can explain them as well. You know, and, that, and that's the external specialism. So that helps close those gaps. Okay, but going back to this report. I'm not happy just about noting the report because I could sit at home and you know, get to note it. And yes, it's good to have a discussion. So I think what we need to do is make a recommendation to Cabinet on what we really feel would be a good option, either uh, one that we haven't given, but be given here, reword it, or pick up on one, two, three, or four. Any thoughts? So, so my view hasn't changed. I, I still think it's option three. The, the, the reason that we don't establish the investment committee is, as, as has been kind of discussed by everybody, we're not entering into any new investments. So it's not needed, might be needed in, in the future. I agree with Bookie actually on, on the training part. I think if we do um, kind, of, kind of recommend that it's taken on by uh, the General Services Committee, it's easier for group leaders to insist that everybody on that committee uh, takes relevant training than it is on any other. So I, I, I would think that we you know, have an informal agreement that any member or substitute member of the General Services Committee does have uh, the, the training that uh, Section 151 officer believes would be useful. Okay, so um, I'd like to take a vote on this. So what we're saying is we've noted all what's been said, we've discussed all what we've been said, and what we would like to do is make a recommendation to Cabinet that we go for um, option three. Is that 
the option. Fine. Yeah, hands up. Yep. Yeah. So you know that was me. So great. What well, I would want, um, I think we'll agree. We've read it, agree with the background, and we would like to make a recommendation that option three is our preferred option for this paper. Agree? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Item seven. Thank you, Chair. I'm um, <coughs> keeping some up. Um, oh, I've got this. Uh, short. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. really short. Sure, like. um, so, this is the draft budget for 22 23 and the medium term financial strategy update. So, Sean has taken the committee through um, iterations of the um, changes that will affect the budget throughout the year, most recently, I think, in November. Um, and, but this is now setting out whether we can balance our budget and happy we have presented a balanced budget. But we're also noticing some challenges in doing so. Um, most notably that there remains a gap which will need to be funded as it has been this year for the combination of reserves and capital receipts um, to bring that final part of the gap down. Um, that addresses 22-3. 23-4 and 24-5, there are the main gaps um, as set out in the exact summary. There will be 8 million and 5.4 million for the subsequent two years. Um, and obviously, work continues to address that, and I'll come on to that shortly. Um, the imbalance in this year's position that assumes a 1.99% general council tax increase and the 1% adult social care precept is taken. And the social care precept obviously funds specifically social care pressures. Um, and it's also proposed, as it says in the summary, that the 1.99% will be allocated to pressures in children's social care. Um, so I'll just go through some elements to report quickly and then I'll throw it open to members for questions. Um, so, in terms of background, just, just reiterating what Sean said at previous meetings, we, we are operating from a low council tax base compared to other unitary authorities. Um, and we raise a significant amount less than for instance one of our nearest neighbours, South End. We raised last year 71, just over 71 million. They raised 87.6 million. And they've got a similar population in terms of size. Um, and obviously council tax, for those who don't know, is a cumulative thing. So if you don't raise council tax in any year, you never will recover that money. So that's how those gaps between authorities arise. They make different decisions about different levels of council tax historically. And um, currently, we've got the third lowest uh, band in council tax versus other unitaries. Um, some other just wider context is relevant, obviously, to the discussion that we partly we've already had and I'm sure we'll have shortly is that our adult social care spend is a very high proportion of the budget and it's higher than the national average. Um, and adult social care is obviously um, an area of growth across the country and we're seeing pressures come through as, our, as other authorities are. Um, just adding to that, um, the LGA have made a comment, the Local Government Association noting the general pressure across the sector and about the need for all authorities, particularly now, to really consider um, in detail if they're not going to raise council tax by the recommended level. Um, we've then got some wider context going back to the previous item. So we've obviously our budget is supported by significant investment expense um, income, sorry. Um, and that is supporting our core budget and historically supported obviously the delivery of some wider member priorities. But as we wind down that approach, that will bring further pressures in addition to the standard items that are coming through social care that we've been discussing. Um, in terms of the changes that were announced, so when Sean came in November, we were waiting for the Labour government settlement. That's now come, and in paragraph 3.8, there's a small table that summarises the changes that were then announced in the specific to us as a local authority. Um, and broadly, we, there was a, a, a net benefit, um, about 2.47 million, as it says. Um, but it sounded perhaps slightly more positive um, 
but you had to take the context of some COVID funding that was in the core budget being taken away effectively in 22 3. So, but nevertheless, a, a net increase, um, and that's where that funding has been allocated back predominantly back into social care priorities. Um, as we move into section 3.13, that then sets out the high level categories of our medium term financial strategy and shows you um, where, the, where the pressures arise and how the savings and funding changes then address that gap. And I think that's probably the simplest summary to consider in this report. And that 22 3 position will form the basis of our budget. So when we set the detailed budget, that will be based on the CFS for 22 3. Um, and then we obviously have remaining gaps to consider. And I think that just a couple of things I would note in terms of progress in that area so far. So we are currently just going through an LGA peer review. So we are looking for feedback and we've had discussions about some of the things mentioned today. There's the, there's the, wide, um, the wider acknowledgement of the pressures in the sector, but there's also a wider discussion about capacity that uh, Councillor Coxall was touching on earlier. Um, but what that hopefully will also bring back, it gives us a sense of where we are next to um, equivalent authorities. It gives us best practice um, information with regard to other authorities to bring back to the authority and just provides a challenge generally across the way we're delivering particularly social care services where the pressures are the largest. Alongside that, those two services have got their own reviews being undertaken, which again are led by um, sector experts in each area, so one for adults, one for children's. They are currently in progress. They will also report back and they will give that sense of um, where we are in current context and where we are to meet the challenges that are no doubt coming. And I think it's just worth flagging in adult social care that includes a fundamental change to the system for which there is some initial funding available and it's not going to affect um, the 22 3 budget we're setting here, but it will go into 23 4 and beyond. And there's a wider discussion about whether the funding enables the transition with, without a negative impact in terms of our cost base and revenue base thereafter. So that works on going, and obviously future reports will come back to the committee in a normal way, which will be bringing reports through this year. We would expect this to be a high priority item in terms of savings delivery going forward throughout the rest of the year. Um, and that's definitely been the case throughout the current year to get to where we are. I suppose it's always useful to give some context, so I speak to our auditors regularly. They met the LGA as well. They were asked to comment about the gaps we have remaining, and their comment was very much along the lines that, in their experience across authorities in this situation, the challenge is very much to address the following year. Work goes on to undertake, and obviously, we try and address more than just the following year, but there's no doubt with the pressures as they are. And the way the funding works, so the mechanism only clarifies funding once a year, probably uh, in December every year, that, that authorities will work throughout every year to deliver the next year, and then we revisit the gap and see where we are. It's completely consistent with other authorities, and in many cases, the gaps we're reflecting are not as um, relatively significant compared to some other authorities. And it, I suppose an even wider context would be uh, there's quite a body now of authorities who are either receiving support from central government or in detailed discussion about that. And we're not one of those authorities, but we do recognise these risks are real. Um, that's the question touched on earlier. The social care um, pressures coming out of COVID have been um, predictable to some degree and funded by the COVID funding for this short term period, but the challenges of COVID funding is um, switched off and replaced with the core funding again, is that we've identified an additional demand in the system through COVID. That demand will continue, it won't just be switched back off when COVID funding ends, but the mechanism to fund it on an ongoing basis is still uh, to be 
determined in terms of its uh, the level of funding required. I think also just adding children's that what we've noted and suspected last year was that the demand was somewhat suppressed by the pandemic. Um, lots of children were at home for long periods of time, and a lot of that demand has manifested itself in the early part of the year. So broadly, that's where we are. Um, the report then outlines the savings. It goes through a broad summary by directorate, and there's the detailed MCFS um, at the back of the report. Uh, on page 44, um, which then sets out the detail of that NCFS and some more detail in appendix two on the individual savings. So I'll stop there, Chair. I'm sure members will have questions. Thank you for the report. Any questions from anyone? No, none at all. Councillor Howden. Thank you, Will. Uh, report on the I think the only thing I would urge is um, serious cash being invested at that capacity issue. Now, whether you call it public affairs, whether you call it policy work, or whatever, um, the, the, the set of lessons County Council have really is formidable. And the things they lobby for, they get results. Um, I saw this you know, close up when I was campaigning for health, and they frequently got things that I did not want them to get because it was a detriment to us. Um, in terms of getting our way out of the budget problem long term, you know, the numbers are the numbers. We know that they're not going to magically improve. That there are certain things that could help us. Business rate reform, we know that economic growth is not really a focus of local government from the point of view of the finance it gets into us. It's, it's important for us in terms of what we can do for our residents, but it doesn't help our bottom line. Um, we know that the, we've suffered in the investment approach because of excesses of unwise approaches taken by boroughs like Corrie. Uh, we know that when it comes to SEND spending, at the moment that is fully on our shoulders. We don't get a penny from the NHS. Despite the fact the NHS can place financial burdens on us to exercise their SEND plans, but the NHS don't have funding in it. So th there are big strategic things that can unlock an awful lot of cash but we need to make sure we build capacity in ourselves to lobby for it because you know, other local authorities out there really yeah. do. And you know, certainly you know, getting that pound out of the NHS and into the health system that we're responsible for, you know, that's something that Essex are extremely good at because they have really knuckled down and built that capacity. So just in response to that, just a couple of things on reform, first of all, Councillor Holden. So uh, fair funding reform is theoretically coming soon um, and it seems to be moving up the agenda quite quickly um, so I think I saw something that suggested um, sort of early summer if not before for a, for a first uh, indication of what that looks like. That's obviously been on hold pre-pandemic and Fair Funding Reform I've done consultations on that and back to for years now and obviously that hasn't really come through to fruition. Uh, business rate retention seems less certain, and that's largely because the new head of the department, Michael Gove, um, is considering that. I think it's fair to say, but I don't, you know, I think the initial comments suggested um, perhaps that was, uh, you know, that another route might be taken. Um, I mean, in terms of business rate retention, it also depends how it's implemented. So we could get a bigger share, obviously, we then get a tariff. And the starting point is a kind of neutral one that increase the tariff equivalently. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, and, and then on the wider points of social gaps, they appreciate the lobbying power of Essex. Um, we've seen that in a number of forums. It's happened in the last couple of years, as you say. Um, we are party to conversations with the wider Essex group, so we are aware if they're lobbying, and often they look to share, particularly across other district councils, that lobbying effort. Um, but I think that doesn't prevent us from lobbying and being part of the consultations, etc. And absolutely, we have the capacity to take part in those things. Okay. Um, yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. I was just going to add to that. I, I think all of that very much links into part of the conversation and comments that were being made by Councillor Cox and Councillor Kent earlier as well around levelling up. I think it's important to realise that the, um, the Chancellor back in October did actually announce a three year 
department level budget for local government. And yet we only got one year settlement um, in December. And that was because they will be looking to change the methodology of how that same pot of money is distributed for the, for the coming years. I mean, it's interesting. We put we there, there's something in um, in this report. I've forgotten what the um, what the name of the pot is. There was one particular grant that they've given us this year to cover the million pound additional um, national insurance. So so with the national insurance increases, um, the council as an employer also has to pay additional national insurance, um, and the council's bid is in the region of a million pound. So they've given all local authorities a grant to actually help cover that. But then they said that's only a one year grant. But yeah, in year two, we're still going to have another million pounds worth of national insurance. And actually, when, you, when you're talking to DBUC, Department for Leveling Up Housing Communities, um, they're talking about needing to hold that money back because as soon as Leveling Up agenda comes through to determine how funding is redistributed for years two and years three, which is 22, three and 23, four, um, there might need to be a pot of money to one side to help phase that for some and provide some form of compensation while others, you know, um, you know gain, gain quite quickly. I've no idea where Thurrock is on that scale. No idea at all. Nobody knows um, what sort of methodology is going to be used for that. So anything that comes through, I think, um, around the Leveling Up agenda, you know, and any other indication. And the other thing is, I think Jonathan's absolutely right, business rates, um, are just another way of allocating funding in the overall pot. So it can be given in one hand. You know, we, 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 you know, we, we've done this quite a lot. You know, the headline is that the Borough Council keeps 49% of its business rates, but actually we keep about 30%. That's you know, it's a significant difference because of, you know, there are other mechanics in there to level that out. So I think it is, it's the uncertainty. Um, my section 25 statement, uh, we'll be talking about how difficult it is still going to be to get through 22, um, 23, this current financial year, the budget we've got inside. But my biggest concern, I think I said this to the committee last time, and I've been quite consistent around it, is 23, 24 onwards. Yeah. Yes, that's noted. Any questions? John? Just, just coming back now, the Bazaar Holy Name Services Grant. The gives the, the national charge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was going to ask about that just being one year, and, and it's the old story, isn't it? You 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 do look at next year's or the year after's budget, not 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 next year's budget. You don't know what's coming along. You don't know what's going to be withdrawn. You're fairly sure that the service grant isn't going to be there. So in, increasingly difficult. You touched on your section twenty five state statement. The, the concern I have. Is that there's an awful lot in the uh, appendix, appendix two, the full savings list, that isn't well enough defined at the moment. Um, and I kind of accept that the way we set budgets nowadays is you know, council sets the budget envelope, cabinet then goes and delivers. How much confidence have you got that this is actually deliverable for the next financial year? Um, it's, tight, it, it, it's tight and it's challenging. Um, I know that there is probably more definition in these than jumping out on a paper. Of course, yeah. No, exactly. So, so that that gives me confidence. I, I think my my concern is going to be less about the delivery of savings. It's going to be more about the increases in demand in social care. If, if I'm truly honest, because you know, if we look at this year, the six month budget position in terms of monitoring showed overspending children's social care at 2.8 million. 3% council tax only actually gets us 2.2%, so it doesn't even go anywhere near, near being able to cover that. You know, and we see now more and more, and it's actually beginning to not, not as bad, but it's beginning to happen in adults as well. Some seriously high costs, individual placements coming through. Which can blow your budget completely, and, and I think you all know those cases you know, far far better than me um, in, in terms of those in terms of other roles you fill. Um, so my my concern is less about the deliverability. We'll we'll be cutting back. We're still going to maintain things like the vacant post savings throughout next year because we have to be doing that in position for 23, 24. We've got to be identifying and implementing savings for 23, 24 next year not waiting for 23, 24 as well. So there's a lot of other um, aspects which will improve the position for next year as well. 
which will form some sort of underwriting, if you like, one of the better phrase. But the concern is going to be the is going to be the demographic growth and those changes. Is is a second concern the and I don't want to be kind of I'm, I'm trying to find a, 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 a kind of neutral way of putting it of overcoming the natural ambition of members. So we do have this ambitious regeneration um, kind of agenda. We know, frankly, that we're not well enough equipped or have enough capacity at the moment to deliver on it. That's going to be another call, isn't it? We're, we're trying to do more and more with less and less. So how, how confident are you that members will keep their discipline? <laughs> I, I'm not even going to attempt to answer any question on behalf of members of any party uh, whatsoever. Um, uh, what, what I can, yeah, there are two or three things that I'll say in, in more general sense though. Um, the only areas where we're actually growing staffing levels um, and capacity is actually in uh, regeneration place delivery and those supporting services and that is only where we are able to fund those posts through capital and through grants and so on and not a demand on the council tax payer. That said, you know, overspends or whatever else, you know, if there are overspends, pressures coming through, you know, for whatever reason, obviously do impact um, on, on the overall budget position. Um, so that, that's something we have in mind. The second part is you've got the capital program uh, on as the, the fine line before the work program uh, on this agenda. Uh, Within there, we're showing you the new projects that are coming forward. It's probably the smallest level of new projects that you've seen ever since I've been here, so. Um, and that, that is deliberately to, to recognise the capacity. And I think the third part, um, it, you know, it's not just a case of members listening to me, um, for the reasons that I outlined about a minute ago, um, but I think the, the common message that's going to come through from, from any of the reviews that we're doing, and, this, and especially the, the preliminary feedback on the peer review, is going to be around prioritisation of capacity. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to ask you about the capital portfolio here. Going to ask Mark. Well, yeah, I, I your point is that it's exactly answered. Answer the political question that, that Councillor mm -hmm. Kemp asked. It's it is that it was last year was identified in that we looked at that as cabinet. We've gone through that to make sure that we've got to pair this down. I think we can go even further than that. It's actually being members and all to actually understand it through some influence and time to actually the most important as I started it was can we survive the local authorities first thing to make sure we can deliver the project well in the ones we do we can do small fewer small better than a lot more ambitious projects and putting a project on there putting a project on there over the last few years the times have changed post COVID and we've got to actually that these are our priorities so I think you see you mentioned this one there and it, it could be paired again but it's just making sure that we, we look at these projects closer. Okay, thank you. Any more questions, Councillor uh, Alvin? Thanks. So I, I don't want to overlay with the, the point about capacity. I think myself and Councillor Kent are um, coming at the same issue, but from the slightly different angles. Councillor Kent's coming at it from you know, how do we do about the infrastructure and project side. The point I was making about whatever you call it, the policy thinking side, the, the public affairs side. The reason I think that's so important, and it goes beyond just you know, filling in consultation to governments, is because you know, we don't exist in a vacuum. Other authorities lobby for things that are not necessarily what we would be in favour of. And if I could just give the example, when Essex were lobbying incredibly hard to change the healthcare boundaries in um, our county, um, they, they were magnificently well armed. And that change, I think, was incredibly likely to go through. It didn't go through because the Secretary of State for Health had to resign. But I think it would have gone through otherwise. Um, it didn't go through largely with luck. But they had lobbied and really successfully. If they had changed the boundaries, it would have made delivery much more difficult for us from a health point of view. If it made more, more difficult for us, I dare say it would have made more expensive for us. So if, 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 if I just give one plea, it's that we do seriously consider that that thinking capacity, that lobbying capacity, that frankly, the two of you can't do because you've got full-time day jobs actually running the books. You've got a substantive job in, in your own right and you can't be doing all this um, all this additional stuff. But that additional stuff, I, I, I genuinely believe, not only reaps great dividends for us, but also prevents 
you know, others from stealing the march list, frankly. Thank you. Councillor Kent. Yeah, I, I, I actually agree 100% with John. You, you know, things that this authority has, has gone back 25 years really not been particularly good at are the kind <coughs> of lobbying, the political intelligence, the general intelligence, the gathering of facts, the taking of baselines, the measuring of, of, of where we've gone, uh, and, and the ability to, 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 to really punch that out, out our way because of that. Uh, I think we have always been under, uh, underfunded ourselves in that area because, frankly, we've all done the same thing. We've all said priorities have got to be children's social care because we don't do anything going kind of wrong. It's got to be cleaning the streets as well as we can. It's got to be all those kind of frontline services. But it does come a time when we do have to say, our government has to say, we are going to cut a little more capacity to allow us to do some of that lobbying, some of that intelligence gathering, some of that research. <coughs> On, on a level that, 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 frankly, we haven't done since kind of 1996 yeah. and put it all together to, to lobby uh, to, to become a unitary authority. Yeah. I completely agree on that. It's, it, it's, it's very, last May I was uh, with external affairs and it goes back to my second question about the capacity and what we need to be doing it. And it's, it's, an opportunity, it's an opportunity in capacity and how public affairs is important over and over again. You see problems of, of where the government writes a consultation based around our big boys around us. Yeah. So Essex, Kent, and London, Mayor of London, and actually we write policy, and we have to abide by the policy, and that costs us money and small authorities. And I think there's an opportunity there with punching about our way, and that's my item. Where and that top line, and maybe it's not the time, but the city of London of Essex is how we deliver a small authority that's got a massive punch of money on the top there. But we've got to need capacity. To and how we do capacity is actually going to cost us money. Yes. Okay, right. Anyone Our money's the thing that we haven't got. Got. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, recommendations. Recommendation one the committee comments and proposed tax tax level blind comments and report. And then the committee comments on the draft budget mm -hmm. as to how. I don't think it's possible to be in agreement with those, with those recommendations, is it? So, you know, comments on uh, proposed council tax level uh, with my two comments in the report, I would say that I am disappointed uh, with the proposal to increase council tax by 2.99%. And I would ask the Cabinet to <coughs> reflect on uh, the current climate with the cost of living crisis, with uh, gas and electricity prices going up to record highs, council putting rates up by 4%, train fares going up by 4%, national insurance contributions going up, and, and everything else. So I would ask that the council uh, reflect on that. Uh, I think the second we, we have on it. Uh, it's <clears throat> worth noting that this rise is for low inflation and um, we do have a very low council tax in the local authority. That's the unitary authority to keep it right and um, to pay for services we do need low council tax. I think you're right. Um, so, what are we going to put here? Well, I think we can know Councillor Kent's yeah, I mean, comment. His comments, and that we shall yeah. uh, totally agree with her. Mm -hmm. um, but do you not agree as well that we are one of the lowest ones uh, council uh, tax? Yes, yeah, I mean, even if we are, but we are thinking about um, the community that we serve. We know that coming back from. from uh, issues of um, lockdown, COVID, jobs and all that. So that is why, you know, But our employment is at this the lowest, is it not? So, you know, I think we're going to be realistic. Unless we have money, we can't spend it, can we? Well, and yeah, the people, and, you know, let's face it, residents want to see. It's all very well to be seeing about lobbying other councils, etc., etc., Essex, but actually they also look at their frontline services. 
um, you know, it has to be paid for. And I think people do actually understand that. That's very helpful. Thanks. Um, I put genuine, I put genuine sympathy for what you're saying because you have to look at the cumulative impact of everything. So the national insurance plus the um, council tax. So I'm, I, I don't find myself in disagreement um, with what you're saying. It's, it's, it's always slightly a, a strange position to find Labour politicians as born again tax cutters and I'm now on the side of uh, high taxes. It's, it, it, it's an interesting turn. I think that Whilst I agree with you in the principle of what you're saying, the bubble that the pandemic has created in child social care for me makes its face complain. The, 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 the report makes it quite clear that the council tax increase is ring fenced into child social care. You know, if this was a tax increase to throw reserves, to throw money to reserves arbitrarily, or if this was a tax increase to pay for luxury items and discretionary spending. Yeah, I, I, I could understand us taking a beat and saying, I'm not quite sure. But when we're talking about ring fencing an entire tax increase just to pay for child social care, if you've been in the portfolio holding for children's services, I have been, um, there are a few frills and luxuries in that department. This, this is a area of, um, in many ways, unquestioning need. So on that basis, Chair, I'm happy to move um, support for the draft cabinet budget process. So, all those in agreement, all those against. Okay, you got that, Grace? Yes. Lovely. Thank you so much. Right, moving on to item number eight, the corporate. Sorry, this is. Uh, Thank you, Captain. Yeah. So, so back to me. Yes. So the uh, capital strategy um, report, along with uh, its appendix and its annex, this covers. Trying to put it as simple as we can, um, it covers the capital program as a total, and how that feeds into what we call the uh, capital finance requirement, the CFR and borrowing levels. Um, page. I'm going to sort of jump about. In yeah, terms so of what's probably us, the most, I'll give you page numbers. Um, page 55 and 56 um, within the uh, actual capital strategy uh, appendix. You've got um, table one and table two, and that shows the projected capital program, um, projected capital program going forward, um, including uh, new schemes, but largely delivering existing schemes. Um, as we've said, the, uh, the new schemes coming forward are fairly minor. Uh, and this, so again, shows, as I say, the levels of uh, council, and then table two, capital program rather than table two, showing how that's being resourced. Um, where it's not being resourced by external sources, um, then that's where uh, increases in debt come through. That obviously impacts on the Treasury program on the MTFS through both increased interest, because we pay more interest and more debt, and more MRP, then the revenue provision, that's the amount we have to set aside annually for the repayment. Moving on to um, pages 57 and 59. Um, Page 57, 259, sorry. Uh, that breaks down the capital financing requirement, um, which is table four. Uh, and that breaks it down between general fund capital program, the council housing capital program, capital investments, and direct regeneration level investments. Now that largely mirrors, so the capital financing requirement is everything that's been paid for out of capital resources and not by other resources. So that largely mirrors debt. It's not exact because there are other um, cash flow timings and so on that come into play, but that largely mirrors debt, and therefore the debt is broken down between those areas um, as, you know, very closely. And table six actually just demonstrates how close that is between the capital financing requirements and the uh, actual level of debt and projected debt. Moving on to table seven, um, you then see uh, what we call the authorised limits and the operational boundary. 
So linking in uh, with those projections that we've just shown on those previous tables, this shows that we would have an operational boundary, that's the level of debt that we wouldn't expect to go above, of 1.5 billion, um, there are thereabouts going forward. Um, but there is an authorised limit, which always uh, basically adds an amount for emergencies, um, and that could be uh, COVID, you know, for instance, and we borrow for specific purposes, could be for cash flow, it can be for timing differences as well. But mainly we would try and stay to the operational boundary level. And I think finally, the, uh, the next main table uh, within this report is actually in the annex, it's in page 71, uh, and that's the projections which feed into the NTFS and the revenue program. And there you can see the uh, debt interest being paid, so that isn't just debt interest on investments, that is debt interest on all of the council's debt, so that includes the HRA, Direct Regeneration Limited, as well as investments. Uh, you then see the investment income um, coming off of there, um, giving you a net interest credit into the general fund. Um, and then there's MRP, uh, that's the minimum revenue provision uh, in the private sector, that's similar to depreciation, but maybe think of it as, um, as principal amounts being set aside for future debt repayment. It doesn't repay debt straight away, it gets held in balances as you go forward until such debt becomes due to repayment. So I think um, there's, I've, I've tried to take you through um, after, after the last couple of years what's been highlighted um, quite, quite considerably. Uh, so I'll try to highlight those particular areas for members uh, in, in that introduction. Um, and I can take any questions uh, from that point. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, for a lovely report. Um, any questions? No, none at all. No. Okay then. So on table uh, on item eight. Um, the recommendation 1.1 on page 50 is approved. Agreed. Right, moving on to number nine. Item number nine. The right now the draft capital program. And we're going to go over to Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we've, we've touched on this as we've gone through the other reports actually in the previous report we've seen to this as well. Um, so we're proposing a capital programme, or additions to the capital programme in this report. As Sean noted earlier, this is quite a relatively small set of additions to the programme. Um, and it sets out um, those projects in the appendix and asks for comment from the committee on the specific proposals. Um, so just, just some context on that, um, just to remind everybody really, just looking back to the previous reports we've just gone through, these capital projects can be funded from a range of sources, so it can be capital receipts, it can be grants and contributions, potential borrowing, or revenue itself if we so determined. Um, broadly, it's a combination of grants, potential borrowing and capital receipts. Um, and I think also just to note, this, this report um, we touch on in the, uh, in the summary at the front, but we've done, we've mentioned more widely, we've got three reports happening, we've got towns funds happening. They are not included in this report because they're going through separate mechanisms. Towns funds got its own separate funding stream from central government, and three reports has got a wider funding stream through uh, additional business rates retention. Those um, projects will come back with via separate reports through the relevant the relevant committees as they progress and three ports is not we're not through to full business page yet approval so that's ongoing towns fund we're at the stage where we're agreeing projects and scoping those projects for central government but there are those further projects to consider but they come with their own funding streams effectively so this is this is everything else essentially and this is our core capital program the report then sets out the current program. A number of those projects have been mentioned in the course of tonight. They're listed on page 83 to remind people some of the major projects that are under development at the moment. Um, and then just to flag the draft capital proposals um, start on page 84. Um, and we've got three 
project costs that we use, so they're basically for um, service review. So where we need to bring in new systems, upgrades to facilities, generate enhancements to open spaces, things like that, we have a pot uh, to support that activity. Digital is hopefully fairly self-explanatory, but it's further progression of all digital systems and new digital systems. And property is supporting our current estate. Um, those pots are then supported by the standalone projects that are listed in Appendix 2, and they form the new proposals to this programme, and they are set out from page 91. Um, and they include this year, we've got fleet replacement, we've got two sets of good repairs, we've got some electrical works at Junction 31 on the internal side, and we've got the general corporate land or maintenance which rules and insurance responsibilities. Um, and obviously it's just linking back to those conversations about maintaining the estate. So that's a very brief summary and um, just, just open to members really to comment on the proposals as noted in the recommendation. Thank you, Sir Jonathan, for your talking. Okay. Thank you, um, Jennifer. Just an um, explanation that I'm going to from digital uh, yeah. the assets, um, I mean, the delivery to the rest of it. What does that mean for? So, so the digital part is really, we've got a digital board, and broadly, the digital board are responsible for all the digital systems in place at the council. And obviously, across the range of services, that could be housing systems, it could be social care, it could be contracting social care, it could be Oracle, which supports all the finance and HR systems. And it's really to continue to develop opportunities to make that digital estate we want to develop right, more efficient over time and enable us to provide the services as a council we want to provide and improve those services to residents. So it's really that broad range and, and the digital board meets and consider um, proposals, they look at opportunities for streamlining the current digital estate. Um, and there's that they, you know, they have a monthly discussion on that. And this pot supports a range of improvements to that core infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? John, no, not, not so much a question. I mean, it's, it's been the kind of topic of, of the evening, hasn't it? The, 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 the fact that this is uh, a disappointing capital programme, uh, but disappointing for reasons that I think we all, we all understand. And you know, it's, it is the new, the, the new, new world, I guess. I, I'm pleased to see uh, both the Orchard footbridge and the, the Tilden Bridge in there, uh, both long overdue. Uh, I'm disappointed that we're still getting a comment on the fleet that says we can't look at, at the, the renewables as a way of powering the fleet. We know that there are other authorities uh, that, that are doing that. Uh, what we've been told in the past is, yeah, but they're mainly city, so they're smaller, so it makes it kind of more deliverable. Uh, I would have liked to have seen uh, a little more imagination and a little, a little kind of a harder look to see if there's a, a way that we can even pilot something uh, whilst we're going out for, for such a, a lot of people. Yeah, I'd actually highlighted that myself, John. Um, I was wondering, you know, uh, these vehicles that we we have, etc., that are going to be renewed, do we actually own them or are they leased? Generally, yeah. 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 So there is a resale value. Yeah. And the other thing is, like John said about the the um, the fuel for them and that, which is a little bit disappointing because when we talk about our status of being a green council and um, getting our green policies up. Not to have, you know, to have something with diesel actually isn't quite the best thing. But not we really need. And I was thinking, when you've got so many firms around here, like big ones that are doing electrical vehicles, actually lorries like Tulsa Downing, Tilbury, I was thinking, well, actually, we could do a simple lot of advertising by giving us a couple of lorries on the cheap, couldn't they? Yeah. No, they are. So I'm, I'm just thinking. You know, I think sometimes we ought to think outside the box and uh, look at these big companies. You know, I wouldn't even mind an advertisement on their lorries if they gave us one or a car. Or whatever. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
I'm happy, we're happy to feed back comments to the service. If there is a comment in there which you'll see that they would, yeah. they would look at that. But it's, it's, you know, absolutely appreciate what you're saying. And if there are wider options, you know, yeah, that can be explored, I'm sure the service would be happy to do the same. Yeah, because I'm thinking if we're going to have another one for mm -hmm. five or seven years, that's seven years more of diesel that we're committed yeah. to. You know, and uh, we're not, we just don't quite know how that all fits in. Okay, right. Any Jen, more? Sorry, Jen, 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 just to confirm, I mean, DB actually challenged that back at the same time as well. Oh, did they? Sorry, Director's Board challenged that back at the same time. Um, but I will take that back again, you know, the, the points from the committee, because it, and actually it is that point as well about seven years um, going into that cycle again, yeah. you know, for that period of time. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll take that back. Okay. Right, that's lovely. Thank you so much. Any other questions? So the recommendations come on the specific proposals set out within this report. And um, it's about the recommendations. All in agreement? Agreed, agreed, agreed. agreed. Right, we now come to item 10. It's nice that the um, spectators agree as well. It is noted. Um, the work program. So this is November, the, we haven't got one coming up because I've only got March. 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 We've got one in March, but I haven't had one in March. Yeah. In March. So is there anything that we think or the capacity to go back and look at some of the things we discussed tonight? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of um, calls from Council of Canada earlier. Um, checking back on the um, timetable of meetings, the cabinet meeting on the 10th side is the 9th of March. <coughs> so the report would have already been written there. Um, so I think it's quite reasonable to bring that back here in terms of any suggestions yeah. coming through yeah. that I can then feed back into the cabinet the following day. I think we need to chair on what in terms of our internal uh, capacity when it comes to local government reform and other bits and pieces. Yeah, certainly. So when do you think we'll be able to fit that in? March, when we've got two items. Okay, so we'll go from, yeah, I know, but sometimes we'll go off and chat for every day. Right, March. So will you add that on, Grace, please? Right, is there any other further business? No? Well, uh, the meeting goes at uh, 8.40 and I look forward to seeing you all again in March. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.